very good evening professor sukulop sir and uh, good very good morning all the dear participants respected dignitaries online present for the inaugural function of aict training and learning academy sponsored one week online faculty development program on photonics organized by department of physics electronics and photonics under the aegis of rajarsh shahu mahavidyalaya latur maharashtra chairperson for this inaugural function and uh, principal of the college dr mahadev gavane sir chief guest for this inaugural function honorable dr david sukulop sir professor of physics at university of oregon usa and member of unesco international team of resource persons who facilitate the workshops on active learning in optics and photonics sansta members invitees resource persons vice principals of our college respected dr ej raju sir respected professor sadashiv shinde sir all the heads of the departments in my college teacher participants research scholars and delegates we feel very much fortunate to see you all here for the inaugural function of atal academy sponsored one week online faculty development program on photonics friends for bringing the innovations in teaching and research and thereby improving educational standards the higher educational institutes including our college rajarsh shahu mahavidyalaya latur must engage collaborate and partner with the institutes of high repute in the rest of the world the conferences seminars webinars workshops and faculty development programs play a vital and key role in this direction sir it is a matter of pride for me to state that by considering the importance and significance of organizing the fdp our parent institute shiv chhatrapati shikshan sanstha latur under the guidance of president dr gopal rao ji patel sir and secretary principal aniruddha jadhav sir inspires our college to organize faculty development programs for motivating education in each and research among teachers and students indeed it is a unique phenomenon as compared to other educational institutes getting education that apply to jict or fdp on the topics with active learning approach in online mode due to covid-19 pandemic situation for this fdp we are fortunate to have the eminent resource persons including professor david sukulop sir university of oregon usa suhed lemar professor institute secretary ox ichu scientific techniques tunisia professor ajay ghatak iit delhi dr professor kul rastogi iit roorkee pradi harna iit warangal dr nishad triple iit surat dr juhi deshmukh savitribai phule pune university pune professor kailasnath madnan international school of photonics cochin university of science and technology kerala professor anchal shrivatsava university of lucknow dr abhit kumar delhi technological university delhi dr pramod watekar starlight technologies limited aurangabad on the behalf of local organizing committee we would like to extend immense gratitude to all of them for accepting our invitation and sparing their valuable time for the benefit of participants we have organized a 15 technical session each of around 2 hours duration we have received the overwhelming response with more than 160 participants with the registrations from 16 states including assam andhra pradesh delhi gujarat jammu and kashmir jharkhand karnataka kerala madhya pradesh maharashtra tamil nadu telangana tripura uttar pradesh uttarakhand and west bengal we heartily welcome all the participants from all these states the organization of this faculty development program in photonics is possible because of financial support from aict training and learning atal academy new delhi on behalf of organizing committee we take this opportunity to thank to them we also express our sincere thanks to the participants from pan india for their active participation during this program 
Our principal and director of this FDP, Dr. Madhav Gavane sir, has taken the initiative for organization of the faculty development program in Photonics and offered constant encouragement and valuable suggestions at all phases of this work. We sincerely thank him. We also thank all vice principals, our vice principals, head of the departments, all teaching and non-teaching, administrative staff and students also. I also thank and hearty uh, extend my hearty welcome to resource persons, delegates, participants, and wish them a pleasant learning during this five days faculty development program. If there are any inconveniences, I request you to be here with us. Now, I will introduce uh, our resource person, today's resource person, uh, Professor David Sokolov, sir. Now, Professor David Sokolov, sir, he is currently working as a professor emeritus at University of Oregon. He earned his BA at Queens College of City University of New York and his PhD in Atomic and Molecular Physics at the MIT USA. For over three decades, he has studied students' conceptual understanding and developed active learning approaches with National Science Foundation and IPSI FIPSE. This includes interactive learning demonstrations. This is a, one of the innovative thing which uh, Dr. David Sukolov sir has invented that is interactive lecture demonstrations, which today he is going to deliver in his presentation. And the core modules of real time physics, active learning laboratories, both published by Wille and co authored by Priscilla Lodge and Ronald Thompson. His work has been published in American Journal of Physics, European Journal of Physics, The Physics of Teacher. He has conducted a numerous international and national workshops to disseminate these active learning approaches to secondary and university teaching faculties. Since 2004, he has been a part of UNESCO Active Learning Optics and Photonics team presenting workshops to date more than 37 developing countries in Africa, Asia, Eurasia and Latin America. He is a contributor to and editor of the ALOP training manual which is mostly used by uh, teaching photonics and optics. The ALOP team was awarded 2011 SPY Educator Award. He, Professor David Sokolov was awarded with American Physical Society 2010 Excellence in Physics Education Award and American Association of Physics Teachers 2007 Robert Millikan Medal. And, and in 2020, Hans Christian Orested Medal. He has been Fulbright Specialist in Argentina in 2011, Japan 2018, and is currently a member of International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. Commission. He, is a, he has a served as a American Association of Physics Teachers President in 2011 in the presidential change of 2009-2012. I welcome Dr. David Sokolov, sir, for this faculty development program on photonics. With this, his brief introduction, I request principal of our college and our captain of our team, Dr. Mahadev Gavane, sir, to deliver the concept note of this faculty development program and briefly the presidential address of this program. Dr. Madhav Gavane, sir, please. Sir. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Uh, a very good morning to all. On the behalf of colleagues, I first welcome you all. Today's FDP, AICT Training and Learning Academy sponsor one week online faculty development program on photonics organized by Department of Physics and Electronics and Photonics. Today's Chief Guest and Resource Person, Honorable Dr. David Sir, Professor of Physics, University of Oregon, USA, UNESCO International Resource Person, since 1999. He has been a part of UNESCO team, presenting active learning workshop in developing countries. Sir, I would like to specially thanks Dr. David sir for taking out time from his already busy schedule and joining us from America. Vice Principal of our college, 
डॉक्टर ए जे राजू सर वाइस प्रिंसिपल ऑफ अवर कॉलेज एस एन शिंदे सर डॉक्टर अभिजीत यादव कोऑर्डिनेटर फैकल्टी डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम ही इज अ वेरी इंथुजिस्टिक एंड हार्ड वर्कर डॉक्टर दयानंद राजेश सर प्रोफेसर उंडाकर प्रोफेसर कुमार सर ऑल फैकल्टी मेंबर्स रिसर्च स्कॉलर्स एंड पी जी स्कॉलर्स इट्स अ ग्रेट प्लेजर टू सी यू ऑल इन एफ डी बी विच इज द नीड ऑफ द करंट एरा राजेशी शाहू महाविद्यालय नव एंड ऑटोनॉमस नोन फॉर इट्स एक्सलन्स इन एजुकेशन स्टार्टेड इन ए वेर हाउस विथ फिफ्टी स्टूडेंट्स अबाउट हाफ ए सेंचुरी आगो दिस कॉलेज फेवड ए क्रिएटेड इट्स ओन एजुकेशन पैटर्न विच इज पॉप्युलरली नोन एज लातूर पैटर्न Our founder management members, under the leadership of Dr. Gopalaji Patil Sir and Honorable Anirudh Jadhav Sir, believe that education only made change in the lives of rural and downtrodden students. With the motto "Pursuit of Excellence," in this college plans, implements, and tries to achieve excellence in every sphere of education. we have shown our academic excellence every year ugc accredited our college a grade two times ugc also has given us college with potential for excellence status with these landmark achievements we became the first autonomous college in entire marathwada region since 2013 14 the college has widened its horizon with autonomy to cope with new challenges and expectation of higher education under the autonomy along with curriculum we have a privilege to focus on overall development of students and their placements we have an active placement cell through which till now many students got placed in various company like tcs wipro infosys serum institute icici bank hdfc bank etc all these efforts are recognized by the government of maharashtra and awarded us with the first best educational institute award the government also adopted the shahu pattern as the state policy of education for schools and colleges eshwantra chavan open university nashik awarded best examination center award our parent university also honored us with best college award Education World India Autonomous College Ranking 2021 also 21 22 has placed us at position of 92nd rank best higher education institute in maharashtra 2021 awarded by proxies media new delhi also top gallant media new delhi our one faculty member dr abhijit yadav now this is uh, coordinator of faculty development program he is a very hard worker and enthusiastic young scientist dr abhijit yadav hod physics for being listed in stanford university usa top 2% scientist in the world ranking in applied physics and materials recently we are honored with best college award and best nss program officer award by government of maharashtra with these academic achievements our students also proved their excellence in nss ncc sports and culture we bagged various prestigious awards and trophies in these activities here i mention the recent achievement of sports that our student jyoti pawar represented india in baseball at international tournament in china in this era of globalization collaborative venture are need of time in this respect we take initiative and have a functional mous with lily university france ncl pune laser macmillan symbiosis eltis million mind national stock exchange global talent track and iit bombay journey of success of the college can be figured out as started with only 50 students which goes to 10000 students at present and we have 10 ug programs 14 pg programs 15 phd programs and 32 different certificate courses 
we are fortunate to gain the trust of students and parents i think this is the greatest achievement of our college this happens because we believe that every challenge in blessing in disguise the current situation that we all are in due to covid 19 is really tough for all of us but as they say every dark cloud has a silver lining this situation gave us the opportunity to arrange one week online faculty development program on photonics active learning in optic and photonics in online mode i believe this fdp will be very beneficial for all participants i want to urge all the participants to take maximum benefits of this fdp as we have a stellar lineup and esteemed resource person from various reputed institute like professor ajay ghatak iit delhi dr vipul lastogi iit rudki dr harnath nit varangal dr nishad deshpande triple iit surat dr jhi deshmukh savitri bai phule pune university pune professor kailas nath international school of photonics kerala professor anchal srivastava university of lucknow dr ajit kumar technology university delhi dr pramod watekar sterlite technology limited aurangabad these extremely high intelligence tia will define and illustrate you the various themes related to topic of fdp as i find photonics is not a part of our everyday language but it serves as a foundation for many technology we depend on daily including those that use light create light detect light or modify light the photonics in the world is very broad in scope with applications ranging from telecommunication fiber optic light to cancer treatment application of photonics are inverse are included all areas from everyday life to the most advanced science example light detections telecommunications information processing lightning metrology spectroscopy holography medicine surgery vision correction endoscopy health monitoring military technology laser material processing visual art biophotonics agriculture and robotics photonics technologies are amazing fascinating it is hard to imagine living life as we know it today without photonics photonics makes the quality of our lives way better and more exciting it safeguards our health and ensure that we consume safe and nutritious food photonics fuels manufacturing and drives the growth of economy without harming the environment lastly it is difficult to imagine a safe and secure world without the help of photonics technology and because photonics is a key enabling technology it is unimaginable to think a future without photonics indeed photonics is a technology with a very very bright future the importance of photonics is also underlined by the significant number of nobel prizes awarded in recent years that's why i'm saying if taken this fdp seriously and honestly i ensure all participants that this will prove a memorable experience to you and you will definitely take home some new fangled competency which i am sure will benefit you in in your professional career i appreciate the effort of taken by dr abhijit yadav sir coordinator faculty development program dr dayanand raji assistant professor all staff members of department of physics in organizing faculty development program with a galaxy of stalwarts dr david sir a huge thanks to you for giving your valuable time and making this event in reach we request you to continue your cooperation in the same way we are very proud to see and you work hard at this age i pray to god that you may live a long life 
I also express my great thanks to AICT for supporting the program. Once again, I thank you to all and best wishes to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now I request a keynote addressee of today's uh, Dr. David Sokolov, sir. Please proceed with your presentation. Dr. David Sokolov, sir, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the introduction, for the for the wishes. Um, and um, I, of course, wish the same to all of you. And I'm very, very pleased to be part of your um, faculty development program this year. And the only thing I could wish more is that we would be rid of COVID and we would be doing this in person so I could meet all of you in person. But yes, yes, sir, given, definitely. Yes, given our circumstances, this I guess is the second, the second best way to do it. So I will uh, proceed, and um, I, at the end, if you if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, so uh, active learning of introductory optics. I I want to thank. Uh, in advance, the two other people who I have worked very, very, very closely with for more than 35 years, and a lot of what I will talk about in this presentation, um, I can thank the two of them, Priscilla Laws and Ronald Thornton. Um, as colleagues of mine, I can thank them for their contributions to the materials and to the development work that went into this. And uh, we, were, ha we are part of a group called the Activity-Based Physics Group. And this, this group was the winner of the American Physical Society Excellence in Physics Education Award um, in 2010. And I also need to thank, right at the beginning, the National Science Foundation in the US and the US Department of Education um, because without their generous grants over a, a number of years, we also would not have been able to develop these approaches. So let me outline for you my presentation. I will first talk about the problem that is addressed by active learning, uh, the characteristics of active learning, um, some Activities on optics from real-time physics, which is a laboratory curriculum, and some activities um, from interactive lecture demonstrations. Then a little bit about research on the effectiveness of these materials in teaching physics. And then um, I will talk uh, quite a bit about UNESCO's Active Learning in Optics and Photonics uh, teacher training program. And then finally, just a little bit about uh, a home adaptation of active learning, which has been useful for many people during the pandemic. Although I dearly hope that in the not too distant future, we won't have need for um, online learning as much as we have had in the last year and a half. So first, the problem. Um, over the years, physics education research has found that students who come into an introductory physics course at the secondary level or the college level have definite views about certain areas of physics, and these views are often wrong. And these, these views are based on the experiences that they've had, because students have had many experiences with physics before they come into a physics class. They ride bicycles, they drive cars, many of them. Um, they walk, they run. These are all physical things, and they reach um, ideas about physics from those activities. And unfortunately, many of those are wrong, and physics education research shows that the vast majority of students, if they're taught in a traditional way, um, leave the introductory course 
with exactly the same views they had when they came into the course. Or in other words, they have little understanding of physics concepts. And this research has been done in many, many different forms over the years, interviewing students, open-ended questions, short answer questions, well-designed multiple choice questions. And it always reaches a consistent conclusion. And that conclusion is that traditional methods of instruction are at fault, regardless of the skill of the instructor. So it's something like, students are saying, I don't know if you know who Bart Simpson is, maybe many of you do, I will not learn physics concepts in physics class. Or we also have a professor, Sheldon, um, and um, who is, says, with my perfectly designed lectures, how can they possibly not learn? And of course, we know from physics education research that lecturing is not an effective way of teaching physics concepts to the vast majority of students, no matter how well the lecture is prepared. So the proposed solution is to develop active learning environments. And the, let me be careful to tell you that these are not meant to replace the entire physics class but they're meant to complement the more quantitative work in an introductory physics class. Because of course, it's very important for students to learn how to solve problems in physics. But in order to solve problems most effectively, they also need to understand the physics concepts. And that's the purpose of active learning. So what do I mean by active learning? What are the characteristics of active learning environments? And in this chart, the left-hand side lists the characteristics of passive learning. The right-hand side contrasts them with the characteristics of active learning. So in passive learning, the instructor's role is the authority. The instructor knows everything, and the job of the instructor is to transmit all of that information, all of that knowledge to the students. But in an active learning environment, the physics world is the authority. The instructor's role is to guide the students to learn from the physical world. In a passive environment, students' naive beliefs that they bring into the course are not challenged. But in an active learning environment, we use a learning cycle. Students are asked to make predictions, to make observations, and to compare their observations with their predictions. So this directly challenges the beliefs they bring into the course. In a passive learning environment, collaboration with peers is often discouraged. But in our active learning environments, we encourage students to work with peers because we know that collaboration and shared learning allow students to learn from each other. And they can learn very effectively from each other if they have um, the, the valid information in front of them that they can understand. In passive learning environments, experimental results are often treated just like facts in a lecture. But in our active learning environments, the results of real experiments un observed in understandable ways, often using computer-based tools, are the basis of learning concepts. And then finally, in passive learning environments, the laboratory is a place where we confirm what we supposedly already learned in lecture. But in an active learning environment, laboratory work is actually used to learn the basic concepts. Now, sometimes there's confusion. There's confusion. People say to me, oh, active learning, you mean hands-on learning. But those are not the same thing. Active learning requires much, much more than hands-on. So for example, you could do the, the, the most fun, exciting, and compelling laboratory experiment or lecture demonstration, and that's definitely hands-on because we're actually doing an experiment. But it is not active learning if the students are not engaged by predictions and discussion. 
And many of you may know about Eric Mazur's peer instruction. And peer instruction involves no hands-on, and yet it is very, very active learning. So a better way of describing what we mean by active learning would be minds on, hands-on and minds-on. So I want to first give you some examples of active learning from, from two of the curricula that my colleagues and I developed over the years, real-time physics, active learning labs, and interactive lecture demonstrations. So since the topic is optics and photonics, I will show you a couple of optics activities from real-time physics. And real-time physics active learning labs are a series of lab modules that use computer-based tools to aid students in doing experiments that help them develop important physics concepts while acquiring vital laboratory skills. The goals are to help students acquire an understanding of a set of physics concepts, to provide students with direct experience of the physical world using computer-based tools, to enhance traditional laboratory school skills, which what I mean by that is to learn from the um, physical world by observing the physical world in many different ways. And there are four modules of real-time physics published by John Wiley Publisher. Um, mechanics, heat and thermodynamics, electricity and magnetism, and light and optics. And so now I'll show you two activities from the module on light and optics. But before I do that, let me just tell you that the activity-based physics group, of which I've been a part, um, has had one, one of their major accomplishments has been developing a number of uses of technology to explore the physical world. So for example, we were very instrumental in developing computer-assisted data acquisition tools um, to use with um, desktop um, computers so students can actually make observations with computers in the laboratory or even at home. And also in the use of video capture and analysis to analyze physical situations. So, here are two examples from module four, real-time physics, light, and optics. And these are examples of the uses of technology to teach concepts from optics. So the first one is from a lab called Polarized Light. And this is a photograph of a, um, it's, it's, it may be hard to see exactly what it is, but I'll tell you that this device here is an optical encoder or a rotational motion device. It measures the rotation of this disc. So as this disc is rotated, as this wheel is rotated, this device is measuring the angle. Yes? Hello? Is everything okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So this device is measuring the angle through which this wheel is rotated and here very very precisely and here I have a light probe and the light probe is facing towards the right and here I have a flashlight and the flashlight has a piece of polarizing filter on the end of it and this disc is another piece of polarizing filter so I think if you you understand what I'm saying here the light coming out of the flashlight is polarized by this filter and it goes through a second polarizing filter and then into the light detector. So you see I can just make a display of intensity of light as a function of angle as I rotate the disk. Okay? And let's see what that looks like and that's what it looks like. And those of you who, um, who know about polarization and who have done this experiment before, 
uh, look at this and say, oh, yes, that must be Malice's law because it's, it's what you get when you have linearly polarized light and you rotate a piece of um, polarizing filter in front of it. But for students, naive students, when they look at that, they say, oh, that must be a sine curve. Um, and so we, but they do certainly see that as you rotate the filter, the intensity goes up and down and up and down, which is characteristic of polarized light. The next thing that students can do is they can model the intensity of the light. And so you don't have to, you don't have to worry about the details, but you may see there's an equation written here. The student have written, students have written an equation and the orange line is a plot of that equation. And in actuality, if you go through the analysis of this, you will find that it's not a sine or a cosine, but it's actually a sine or cosine squared, which is what Malice's law is. So students discover that the intensity depends on the square of the angle of the, I'm sorry, the square of the cosine of the angle. A second lab in this module used the same uh, uh, rotational motion device. You can see that sitting here. And there is a light probe behind it. And now this, di this wheel can be moved along. And as you move it, oops, sorry, go back. As you move this along, it's measuring the angle which means it can very precisely measure the distance that that light probe is moving. And over here, you see a laser and a slit film. So we can look at the light pattern of two slits with a red laser or with a single slit. And when you do that, so you, we're collecting again intensity versus angle, which is intensity versus position. When you do that with the two slits, you see this pattern of intensity, which as again, people, those of you who know about two slit interference know that this is characteristic of two slit interference. And if you shine it through one slit, this is what you get. And here is the characteristic central maximum of a single slit pattern. And you may notice that these are right on top of each other. And if we superimpose them, you find that the pattern from a single, from a double slit is a, is a series of um, fringes modulated by the single slit pattern. That's why the intensity goes up and comes back down again. Okay, these are very, very nice. The tools are very, very nifty. Um, but uh, technology itself does not solve conceptual learning. The tools are nifty, but it is the fact that they are carefully designed that's enabled us to change the pedagogy to make it a more active pedagogy so students actually learn better. So those are examples from real-time physics from a laboratory. But of course, many students spend a lot of their time in a lecture. In fact, they usually spend at least as much time or maybe even more time in a lecture than in a laboratory. So the question is, can we make a lecture? Um, whether it's a large or a small lecture, can we make that a more active learning environment? And I, I love this cartoon. Here is a class, and uh, there I, there's Professor Sokolov, supposedly. And I've been lecturing and lecturing and lecturing. And finally, a student raises his hand and says, can, you, can I please be excused because my brain is full? In other words, I can't take any more lecturing from you. So the question is, can we make a lecture more active? And the answer is through the use of interactive lecture demonstrations. So let's look at 
what interactive lecture demonstrations are. So, and I'm going to illustrate this by looking at some octave, optics activities or image formation activities in interactive lecture demonstrations. So here's the way this will work. I will show you some demonstrations and ask you to make individual predictions. So I actually, I think I will, I, I will give you a, each a couple of minutes to make a prediction when I show you the demonstration. I want to point out to you that when we're working with students, we tell them that we never grade predictions. Predictions are something that you, you make based on everything you know. Uh, a prediction can't be right or wrong. The only way, the only thing we can do in a prediction, with a prediction, is compare it to the physical world. And then we can tell whether we predicted correctly or incorrectly. So we don't, we tell students, we want you to predict what you really think will happen in a situation. But we will give you some points for being here and for partic participating. Now, if we were together in a lecture room, all of us, I would ask you to discuss your predictions with your nearest neighbors. And then I'd ask you to see if your small group of two or three uh, people can reach a consensus on the prediction. Unfortunately, we can't do that here. And it's, it's too complicated with this bigger group to go into um, breakout groups. So I'm not going to do that with you. But I want you to understand that that would be the next step. And then finally, I will do the demonstration and show you the result. And then if we were in a regular classroom, I would ask you to discuss what you observe with the whole class. OK, so let's go ahead. And actually, instead of doing the demonstrations, I'm going to show you photos of the demonstrations. So please try to imagine that I'm actually doing the demonstrations live for you, that we're actually in a live classroom. But of course, unfortunately, we're not. So this sheet of paper, which you would have a copy of if this was actually my class, is called a prediction sheet. And during class, you are asked to write predictions on this sheet. And you would be asked to put your name at the top. And at the end of class, at the end of lecture, I would ask you to turn in your prediction sheet, but only for the purpose of taking attendance so that I know that you were there. OK, so let me describe for you the first demonstration, demonstration number one. You have a converging lens. And there's an object in the shape of an arrow. It's positioned outside the focal point. Um, and what I would ask you to do is to draw several rays, draw a ray diagram um, from the head of the arrow and from the foot of the arrow to show how the image will be formed with that lens. Okay, and then the next question is, is this a real image or a virtual image? Now, I think because we're not going to be able to share these, I won't actually air, ask you to write down your prediction. But you, I'm going to give you two minutes to think about how you would draw this ray diagram. If you have a piece of paper in front of you, you can draw it. But at least think about how you would draw the ray diagram. So two minutes, and then we'll come back. OK, one more minute.
30 seconds. Okay, um, so let's let's go on. So at this point, as I said, if you were really in my class, if we really were in a classroom, I would ask you to uh, discuss this with your neighbors, and then I might ask for some volunteers to tell me what your small groups agreed on. But we're not going to do that today. We'll move on. And by the way, at the end of this talk, I will talk about a way of doing interactive lecture demonstrations in an online form uh, right at the end of the talk. Okay, let's move on. So you've made your prediction. We've, we've uh, discussed predictions. And now I'm going to show you the experiment. So here's the apparatus. The apparatus consists of an arrow, a light bulb, at the top of the arrow and a light bulb at the bottom of the arrow. Um, and right here is the lens. OK. And so I'm now going to, so we have a point source at the top of the arrow, a point source at the bottom of the arrow. And now I'm going to turn both light bulbs on. And Again, if we were in class, I would ask for a volunteer to um, explain what we're looking at. But I'll do that because we don't. We we it's it, it's not convenient to have people volunteer and talk right now. So we would see I, that the light from the top bulb is being focused here, and the light from the bottom bulb is being focused there, and therefore we get an image located here. The image is inverted because the light from the top of the arrow is focused to the bottom. And the image is real because the light is actually focused to points. If I put a piece of paper here, I could see that the light is actually being focused there. All right. So that's the first demonstration. Let's move on to demonstration number two. Demonstration two says, what will happen to the image if you block the top half of the lens with a card? And answer in words and show what happens on the diagram by making any changes needed in your ray diagram. So here's what it looks like. There's the card. It's blocking the top half of the lens. Everything else is the same as before. I'll give you one minute just to think about what will happen to the image and by the way, you should also think about what your students will say um, would happen to the image. Okay, so one minute. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, myself, Dr. Anupnath, sir, uh, the intensity of the image will be reduced. Okay. Thank you. I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't want you to tell me <laughs> because we're not going to do, I said we would normally do it that way, but we, we're not going to do it. Um, so, so thank you for your answer. Um, thank you for your answer. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So you've had a minute to think about it. I hope you have your prediction. Again, we would have you discuss in small groups. And we would have you each several groups share their predictions, but let's let's move on. I'm blocking the top half of the lens, and as my volunteer said, the image will be still there in the same place and whole, but it will be dimmer. Do you want to explain why it will be dimmer? The person who spoke up before? Please. Hello. Uh, sir, uh, 
the number of rays uh, producing the image will be reduced will be reduced okay and and why will there be a whole image why will the whole image be there same same person somebody else why will there be a whole image Someone else want to volunteer? Just unmute mute yourself. Because by the way, the majority of students, if you ask them to predict, to predict what will happen, they will either say that half the image will go away or the image will completely go away. So we see here that the image didn't go away and nope, none of the image went away. Why? Somebody can somebody tell us very clearly, please? Anyone? Let me ask this. Yeah, go ahead. Whoever that is. Yes, somebody? Okay. It's very hard to do this with uh with so many people um in a virtual setting so i'm going to i'm going to tell you but in in lecture i would never tell you anything i would always have students give the answers so it i'll just ask the question is light from the top bulb hitting this part of the lens yes is light from the bottom bulb hitting this part of the lens yes so light from all of the arrow can hit the bottom half of the lens and therefore the entire image is formed Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's move on. So the third demonstration, and I'll just show you uh, uh, what the result is. It, it says, "What will happen if you block half of the object with a card?" Okay. Everything else being the same, and of course, if you block the top half of the object with a card, then none of the light from the top half of the object can reach the lens. You're blocking it. And therefore, half of the image will not be formed. OK, so again, I hope you understand that in class, I would not be talking. The students would be talking. I would be asking the students to explain what they observed and to explain what their group discussed. So let's talk about the steps of interactive lecture demonstrations. There are eight steps. Describe the demonstration and do it for the class without displaying the results. Ask students to record their individual predictions on a prediction sheet. Have the class engage in small group discussions. Elicit common student predictions from the whole class. Ask each student to record um, a final prediction on the prediction sheet, which will be collected. Carry out the demonstration and display the results. Ask a few students to describe the results and discuss them in the context of the demonstration. And there's also a results sheet that looks exactly like the prediction sheet, which students can fill out and take home with them so that they have a record of what they did in class. And then finally, if appropriate, discuss analogous physical situations or an application of the concept. So let me ask, can somebody think of an application of the idea that if you block part of a lens, you still get the whole image? Does somebody have an idea? Volunteer? Anyone? No? OK, well, what about with a camera? You have a camera, and you close down the iris. You're blocking part of the lens. Do you still see the whole image on the film? Yes, of course you do. And what about your eyes? When you walk from a dark room into a bright room, uh, the iris 
in your eyes, irises in your two eyes close down. So you're blocking part of your lens. Do you still see, or blocking part of your cornea? Do you still see the whole image? Yes, of course you do. So it's the same idea. So this procedure is followed for each of the lecture demonstrations in an interactive lecture demonstration sequence. So as I said before, at the end of the talk, I'll show you some home adapted versions of interactive lecture demonstrations. OK. So those are two examples of active learning strategies. Now, one important thing is that if you try a new strategy for learning, it's very, very important that you um, uh, do some research on whether it's effective or not, which often means comparing its effectiveness to the old method of instruction. So the question here is, for interactive lecture demonstrations, do students learn concepts better from these image formation ILDs than they do from lectures, from straight lectures? And the way that the research that we've done has used something called the light and optics conceptual evaluation. The light and optics conceptual evaluation is a multiple choice test, but it's research based. It's based on open ended research. And it has actually has 50 questions on it, and they're on very different areas of optics. But I'm just going to show you the questions that are on image formation. So they refer to the demonstrations I just did. The questions deal with this situation. There's an object. There's a lens, and there's an image on the screen. It's, it's a stamp. There's an image of the stamp on the screen. And then there are a number of questions, in this case, six questions, that ask what will happen, how will the image change if you do various things, like block half the lens, block half the object, remove the lens, move the lens closer, and so on and so forth. So those are the questions. These are results for uh, general physics students at my university. The black bar is for students pre-classroom instruction. And the gray bar is post-traditional instruction, which means the students were lectured to, they did homework. Um, and um, homework problems, and uh, basically that's it. And but they had re they had received all of the instruction on image formation that they ever will in this class. And from pre-instruction to post-traditional instruction, there was only a twenty percent gain in their knowledge. So not very good. But, whoops, when those same students um, spent one more hour, and this hour was doing these image formation interactive lecture demonstrations, their gain was then 80% from pre-instruction rather than 20%. The last question on the test is one where students are given a situation with an arrow, a lens, and two rays from the bottom, two rays from the top, and two rays from the bottom. And these are not special rays, right? They're not parallel to the axis. They're not through the center of the lens. They're not towards the focal point. So they're very unspecial rays. And the question is, they are asked to continue these rays to show how they form this real image. Now, if you understand what a lens does, then you understand that if this is a perfect lens, that the two rays from the top of the arrow, this one 
and this one both have to be focused at that point, and the two rays from the bottom of the arrow have to be focused to that point. So you can immediately answer the question by drawing rays to those points. After traditional instruction, only a third of the students did that correctly. After the interactive lecture demonstrations, more than three quarters of the students did it correctly. So it appears that these interactive lecture demonstrations are effective in changing students' conceptual views about image formation. Now, one other thing I want to say to you, because you may be wondering, why do we use miniature light bulbs instead of using a ray box? Um, a ray box is a device that gives a discrete number of rays um, that can be parallel to each other or converging or diverging. And the answer is this. The research that's been done shows that students don't understand that every point on an object is a source of an infinite number of rays, or we can also refer to it as a cone of light. This infinite number of rays or cone of light emanates from each point on the object, and for a perfect lens, all the rays, all the light from a single point that hits the lens will be focused to the same corresponding point on the image. So each point on the object has a corresponding point on the image. Instead, students think in terms of a small number of rays because they get used to where drawing ray diagrams that only have a small number of rays. And so they believe if you block half the lens, for example, you block some of those rays. And that's why they might think that you only get half an image or no image. So in these interactive lecture demonstrations, instead of using discrete rays, we use discrete point sources that emit an infinite number of rays, each of them. OK. Why are these active learning curricula effective? Well, when you ask students to make predictions, it requires them to consider their beliefs before they make observations of the physical world. So the real-time physics labs and the interactive lecture demonstrations build upon the knowledge that the students bring into the course. They are put in touch with the knowledge that they had before they make their observations. One reason why we don't grade predictions is because we want students to put down what they really believe. If you tell them you're going to put a grade on it, they will try to put down what they want, what they think you want them to believe, not what they actually believe. So, we tell them, you're free to put anything you want on the prediction sheet. Whatever you believe is true, that's what you should put on the prediction sheet. Whoops. Secondly, in interactive lecture demonstrations, the students make a prediction. They then discuss with their peers, so they defend their prediction with their peers. And they write down their prediction on a prediction sheet that will be handed in. So they are engaged. They want to, they believe their prediction is correct, and they want to know the result of the demonstration. So they pay very close attention to the demonstration. When it turns out, as is so often the case, that their prediction is different than the result, there is a disequilibrium. That's what psychologists call it. They can't understand why was their prediction wrong. And therefore, they are at a moment that they are open to learning. There is a learning opportunity. And then students can construct their knowledge from observations of the physical world, which are displayed very clearly by this type of demonstration, which means students are behaving as scientists. They're basing their knowledge on observations of the physical world. 
let me just note in passing that Mazur's physics education group at Harvard University has done some research on retro demonstrations. And they find out that if you do a lecture demonstration for students and you don't ask them to make a prediction before they see the demonstration, then the majority of the students at the end of the lecture will not even be able to describe the result of the demonstration correctly, let alone learn from the demonstration. It's very important. It's essential that we engage the students in the learning process. How do we choose experiments for ILDs? Well, there's si simple single concept experiments that build on each other. So ILDs are a sequence of demonstrations, one building on the previous, each one building on the previous ones. The students must trust the apparatus. So we must do very simple things first. Um, so they believe in the results. And just one other thing, again, about the demonstrations that we often do in lectures, they are too complex. It's almost impossible for students to learn from them. They need to be broken down into smaller pieces, and then maybe students will be able to learn. How do we use ILDs? We introduce concepts with them. We review or clarify concepts. Or sometimes we use them in conjunction, in conjunction with uh, laboratory activities. So there's a book um, that contains all the materials to do interactive lecture demonstrations. I've given you a link. If you go and look in the chat for this um, uh, session, you will find um, those uh, demonstrations. Um, so in, in the ILDs, there are actually four sets of optics. There, there are 28 different sets of interactive lecture demonstrations, but there are in all the different topics of physics. But there are four on optics, reflection and refraction of light, image formation, the one I just showed you, mirrors, and polarized light. OK. Amele, please. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't understand you. Hello? Yes. Okay. Can I can I go ahead? Yes, sir. Yeah. By the way, can you please tell me uh, when when my session will end? At what time? Hello? When will the session? You have 40, still, you have 40 minutes. 40, 40 minutes still. OK. Yes. Thank you. All right. Yes. OK, good. All right. So let me move on to the sixth part of my talk. Because from these developments of active learning strategies in 2004, um, we had the idea to develop a teacher training program called Active Learning in Optics and Photonics. And Active Learning in, uh, in Optics and Photonics, the strategies of learning were based on the things that I just showed you, real-time physics and interactive lecture demonstrations. But the idea of Active Learning in Optics in Photonics is to have a one-week teacher training program to teach teachers starting we started out with college and university level teachers 
and then we moved on to do it with secondary teachers to teach them how to teach in an active way the various topics of optics and photonics. So let me tell you a little bit about this program. Active Learning in Optics and Photonics, or ALOP, is a project of UNESCO, and presently it's supported by SPIE, which is the International um, Optics and Photonics Engineering Society, and by the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics. The creators, among the key creators, were Alex Mazzolini from Swinburne University and Manella Alarcon from UNESCO. She's now retired. Actually, they're both now retired. The current director of ALOP is Joe Nimola, um, who is at ICTP. Um, this is just a photo of some participants in the second ALOP that was ever uh, taken. By the way, the, the person in the middle is Suad Lakhmar, who is going to speak to you later during your uh, professional development uh, program here. Um, but since 2004, there have been 37 of these week-long workshops. Um, 15 of them in Africa, 10 of them in Asia, and that includes three in India, uh, one in Delhi, one in Mumbai, and just a year and a half ago, one in Pune. I'll show you some more photos of the one in Pune a little bit later on. And then finally, nine in Latin America and three in Eastern Europe and Eurasia. Alop, as I said, is a teacher updating in optics and photonics, and it's an introduction of innovative, active learning approaches to faculty in developing countries. It's hands-on, minds-on learning. It uses simple, inexpensive apparatus available locally or easily constructed. And by the way, at each ALOP workshop, at the end of the workshop, we give away 10 sets of all of the equipment used in the workshop. It's locally organized. Uh, so the one in Pune was organized by Sangeeta uh, Kale um, of the Defense Institute. Um, and she invited all the participants, set up all the facilities, and so on. And her staff was invaluable in helping us. And they're regional. So we try to have workshops which not only attract participants from the country where we do it, but also from neighboring countries. And it's taught by a team of teacher trainers from developing and developed countries um, who volunteer their time uh, to present. And the team is made up of, of volunteers from the Philippines, Tunisia, Australia, the US, and Canada per currently. And we also often try to train local trainers so that they can present future ALOPs in their own country. These are uh, some of the uh, team, international team of presenters. Um, and um, again, there's Suad, who you will hear from later. Um, and these are the people um, who presented uh, certainly the earliest ALOP workshops. I don't remember where this picture was taken. Just showing you actually a trainer, a training of an assistant. This is uh, Weedy who was a participant in Alap Bandung, which was two years ago in Indonesia. And he was an assistant trained to be a facilitator. Um, this, of course, was right before the pandemic. And he is actually, as an as assistant uh, trainer, he is actually presenting a magic trick um, to the participants in this photo. And here's he's doing something else as well. Let me show you the apparatus. So 
instead of using uh, an acrylic lens in those demonstrations that I showed you, which is rather expensive, this is a food container that you can fill it with water. And when you fill it with water, it behaves in exactly the same way as that other lens, as you can see. It behaves as a cylindrical lens. And it's very inexpensive. Here are some other materials. Whoops, sorry. Um, inexpensive lasers, cellophane filters, uh, gratings from CDs by removing the coating on a CD, flashlights as light sources, and paper towels, spectroscopes, and slits scratched into um, a, um, a mirror or scratched into a um, paint coating on a piece of glass. So very, very inex inexpensive equipment. There are five modules that we do over five days. Introduction to geometrical optics, which I uh, wrote. Lenses and Optics of the Eye, which was written by Vengu Lakshminarayanan. Um, Interference and Diffraction, written by Joel McQuilling and uh, Zora Ben Lakhtar. Atmospheric Optics, written by Ivan Kulaba. And Optical Data Transmission and Wavelength Division Multiplexing, written by Alex Mazzolini. There is a training manual. Um, it contains an introduction to active learning, all five modules, both the student materials and the teacher guides. Um, and it contains the light and optics uh, conceptual evaluation and information on how to do action research in your classroom. Um, over the years, we have done ALOPS in other languages than English. We've done them in French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, and therefore, the manual has been translated. There's a French, official French version, uh, Spanish version, and Arabic version. Just a little bit about my module. My module, just to illustrate for you, it's made up of activities from Real-time physics, uh, module four. The things that I showed you were high-tech things. There are also some low-tech things in that module, and they are part of ALOP. Uh, interactive lecture demonstrations, like the ones I showed you, and some optics magic tricks. Here's an example of an optics magic trick. So it's called the reappearing test tube. There's a glass test tube and a hammer and a magic wand. I take the glass test tube, I break it, put it in an envelope and break it into many, many pieces. I put the pieces into this magic fluid. I say the magic word. And then when I reach in, I take out a whole test tube. And this is a magic trick that has to do with um, index of refraction matching. The magic fluid has the same index of refraction as the glass in the test tube. But this would, this would not be active learning, except that, by the way, here we see the test tube in water, and you can see it very clearly. But here, when the test tube is in the magic fluid, you can't see it. To make it active learning, there's a series of, series of questions. Um, and the students in small groups discuss these questions and try to come up with explanations for the magic trick. So unlike a real magic show, in my magic show, uh, students find out how the tricks are done. So I guess I'm not a very good magician since I tell people how to do my tricks. By the way, in case you don't know, if you use Pyrex glass for the glass, um, then the magic fluid is cooking oil, like canola oil, corn oil, etc. The capstone in module five is optical communication and wavelength division multiplexing. So we start out by looking at very simple communication systems like cups and a string, uh, which are analog. 
systems and then compare them to digital systems. Um, we look at a digital transmission system consisting of an LED and an optical fiber. And this uses everything that we've taught in the previous modules, rays, total internal reflection, dispersion, absorption, and scattering. And then we do a little bit on wavelength division multiplexing. How is it possible to send a number of different signals down the same optical fiber so that allows the optical fiber to um, carry much, much more information than if you could only send one signal? So, and then of course we have to use dispersion with a prism or a diffraction gradient to separate those signals. This is, was talked about in an article in the American Journal of Physics written by Alex Mazzolini. Um, and just to show you, there he is again, to show you what this looks like. Here is a uh, transmitter an op with, a, with an LED, an optical fiber, and a lens. And over here is a screen, but we could also put a detector there uh, with a with a um, uh, phototransistor and detect the signal. And here are some students um, in Indonesia playing around with that apparatus. Um, and so here are actually some photos from Pune, from the ALOP that took place in Pune. Uh, here's the wonderful banner that they made up for us, Active Learning in Optics and Photonics. Last, uh, sorry, uh, it will be two years ago coming this December, so it's right before the pandemic began. Again, here are some uh, participants uh, using lenses to examine how the eye works. Um, and uh, some scattering in a fluid, again, scattering to see why the sky is blue. And here's the whole um, group. There's Sangeeta, Alex, me, and you may recognize some of the other people uh, from this very workshop. Um, there's Suad again, by the way. And by the way, um, after the workshop, we were privileged to go to the Lila, uh, Lila Punawala Foundation and teach some optics. I actually did some optics magic tricks. You can see them here for a group of girls um, at her school, which was a very, very great pleasure. So the LOP team was the winner of the SPIE um, Educator Award in 2011. Now, if you want to know more about ALOP, there is a link. Um, again, it's in your chat. So copy down that link, and you'll be able to find out more information about ALOP. So for the final part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic and about online virtual learning. And back in um, last March, when the pandemic came upon us um, and I was sitting at home, I thought, is there some way that we can do something like interactive lecture demonstrations but have students do it at home? And so I developed what I ended up calling home adapted interactive lecture demonstrations. So just a little bit about their design features. So they're based on the interactive lecture demonstrations in the book that I showed you. Um, they're designed to, inter to introduce concepts or review and clarify concepts. They're designed to be just one of a number of at-home components of a course. So they're not meant to be the whole course, but they're meant to supplement what you're doing in the course. They envision students working alone online, so there's no requirement of group work. No collaboration is required, although it could be incorporated if you 
are using something like Teams or Zoom and you know how to use breakout groups, you could incorporate that into them, but they, you don't have to do that. Uh, they incorporate student predictions, observations, comparisons, and explanations. But they make use of videos, photos, graphs, and even simulations for experimental observations. So they are available at this link. And again, if you go into the chat, you will find that link. And I welcome you to try these. Um, they're free. Anybody can use them. They're all um, uh, available. There's actually uh, 26 of them on different topics in physics. Um, if you click on that link, you will end up going to a page that looks like this. And I'm going to, there's a, there's a list of ILDs. This is not a real link. So I'm going to go to a page that actually has hyperlinks. And what I'm going to do is show you an example of a, a, an at-home adapted, a home adapted ILD. And then what I'm going to show you is polarized light. So I'll click on this. And when I do that, I end up going to the web page. So I'm now online, and you'll notice that this looks very much like the prediction sheet that you saw, only this is an online prediction sheet. But you see it says here, click here to download a prediction sheet. So if I click here, you notice that it's downloaded a Word file. And if I click on the Word file, there is the prediction sheet. So the students can download a copy of the prediction sheet, and it's anticipated that they will actually fill out this prediction sheet. And if you like, they can send it to you with their predictions on it. OK, let's go back to the web page, though. Now, um, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these. I want to show you. Um, Demonstration number two says we have unpolarized light and we put a polarizing filter in front of it. What will happen if we rotate that polarizing filter through 90 degrees? So the students are asked to make a prediction for that. And then it says only after you have made your prediction, click here to see. Um, the direction, oh, I'm sorry, you know what I'm, I, yeah, that's right, okay. To see the direction of the transmitted electric field and click here to view a video of the experiment. So I'm just gonna click here and get the video. Oops, and here's the video. So there's flashlight, it's unpolarized light. There's a piece of Polaroid. We rotate it, and I think you would agree that nothing happened, that the intensity is the same. When I rotate it. OK. I'm going to close. Uh, let's see. Do I want to close this? I think. Oops. Sorry. OK. Now, let's go down and we'll just we'll look at one other. So this one says unpolarized light is polarized vertically by passing through a polarizing filter. If I put a second uh, polarizing filter at right angles, um, what will happen? So here we go. Again, you would make a prediction. Um, and only after you make the prediction, we can go look at the video. And here's the video.
Okay. So, by the way, you may um, you may be noticing that um, I use the lenses from Polaroid sunglasses to do this experiment. The reason is that I was during the pandemic. I wasn't able to get into my um, laboratory. So I had to use something that I had, and I had a pair of Polaroid sunglasses, so I took them apart and used those Polaroids or polarizing filters. Okay, so that's an example of what these look like. I, again, I invite you to um, look at them through that link, and um, I invite you to use them with your students if you like, if you want to. So I would say to you, the important thing is to engage your students in the learning process, which means using active learning strategies. If you're, if you're not doing that, you should be aware that students are not engaged. And physics education research shows that they are probably not changing their views of physics based on your efforts. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and I welcome any questions. Um, so I, I think if you want to, um, oh, yeah. So by the way, just let me remind you, there are three links. And as I understand it, they are in the chat. So if you know how to get to the chat, you should copy those three links because I don't, because once this talk is over, unless they recorded it and make the recording available, you won't be able to get the links. So copy the links, um, whether you think you'll use them or not, at least you'll have them. But if you should lose them, just email me and I'll be happy to send them to you again. So anyway, now um, I welcome any questions. So are there any questions or comments? Dear participants, if you have any questions or discussion, if you wish to have a discussion with uh, David, sir, please uh, raise your hand or either you can put your questions in the chat box. You raise your hand, we will allow you. Or if it, you can put it in the chat box also. I, I'm not sure I know how to get to the chat box. Okay, sir. How do, I, how do I get to the chat box? Oh, it is not, not available on your site, sir. Correct. Yeah, so I can't, I cannot see the chat. If at all there are uh, questions, I will read it. Well, wait, can the participants see the chat box? Participants, can you see the chat box? No, no, they can, they also cannot see the chat box. No, but sir. Then yeah. you, uh, please ra raise your hands, participants. No, no, but how can we, then they can't see my links. Okay, I, I will share in our WhatsApp group, sir. Links. You will share the links? In the WhatsApp group. Okay. Yes. All right, so make sure, make sure yes. people that you get the links from him. <laughs> yes, sir, yes. Okay. Questions? You can just, if you want, are they able to unmute themselves? Dear participants, yes. Nilesh, can I wish to ask a question? Nilesh, sir, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, yes. How, uh, how to identify the direction of uh, polarized glass, uh, polarized sunglasses? the direction of polarized axis i i i the, of sunlight uh, no uh, sunglasses oh sunglasses how do you identify huh. it 
Mm. Well, I think, uh, okay, if you want to have a, a good physics explanation, think about it. When you wear sunglasses, the reason for wearing polarized sunglasses is because you want the light that reflects off a, the windshield of a car or off a lake. When it comes up into your eyes, you want it to be blocked, okay? And when, when, you, when light is reflected, so the light is coming towards me and being reflected into my eye, okay? Okay. The polarization on reflection is this way, perpendicular to the plane, of, to the plane that those rays are traveling in. So therefore, I want to block the reflected light, which has more of a polarization this way. So therefore, I want the Polaroid on the sunglasses to have its axis vertically. So Polaroid sunglasses have their axis vertical, just like I showed you. Of course, the way you could determine that independently of, of um, how you use them is to get a piece of Polaroid that you know the direction of the axis and use it, right? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. Sure. Okay, well, thank you, sir. Okay. Other questions? Yes? Comments, questions? What do you think about active learning? See, this is the problem with uh, passive learning. <laughs> there's, there's nothing more passive than uh, virtual learning. <laughs> Unless you go through great efforts to make it active. And you can, if you, if, you, if you are teaching passively like this, you have to use, do they have breakout groups in Teams? Can you can you divide the people up into small groups? I'm just yes, wondering. Yes. You can. Yes, yes. So breakout you can get you can get people into small groups to discuss things. Yes. You can use things like home adapted ILDs where they yes. make a prediction first. But but remotely it's hard. It's much even much harder to do active learning. But I assure you that if you don't make an attempt to do some sort of active learning, a vast majority of your students are not learning, are not learning what you think they are. And if you don't believe me, then take the light and optics conceptual evaluation and give it to your students and see how they do. I don't think, I think you'll find that your general physics students don't do very well. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, dear participants, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or, and directly ask to sir. Somebody raised their hand. Yeah, speak up. Whoever, unmute yourself and somebody, okay. Yes? I think, uh, sir, there are no questions. Okay. No. Yes. Uh, no. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, thoughtful, innovative, and uh, very fruitful lecture. Now, I request my departmental colleague, Dr. Dayanand Rajay, sir, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. Sir, yes. Thank you for all your help. Hello. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. One minute. Official vote of thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you, David, sir. Thank you. It's my pleasure, sir. I am uh, here for vote of thanks. 
रेस्पेक्टेड चेयरपर्सन ऑफ दिस इनॉग्रल फंक्शन ऑफ द फैकल्टी डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम अवर बिलवड एंड इंस्पायरेटर अनिरुद्ध जी जाधव सर विच इज अ पेरेंट एजुकेशन सिस्टीम पेरेंट ऑफ द एजुकेशन सिस्टीम लातूर एंड सेक्रेटरी ऑफ दिस शिव छत्रपति शिक्षण संस्था लातूर बिकॉज ऑफ सम इम्पॉर्टंट मीटिंग ही हेज नॉट हियर बट ही इज अवर इंस्पायरेटर एंड excellent personality distinguished guest and resource person dr david sokolov professor of physics university of yerevan usa honorable principal dr mahadev ji gavani sir our beloved young energetic and dynamic principal of this rajarshi shaho mahavidyalay latur and the director of this fdp honorable vice principal dr aj raju sir honorable vice principal professor sn sindhe sir coordinator of the faculty and dst young scientist awardi hod of this department dr abhijit yadav sir all advisory committee members members of the institute organizing committee members all hods participants ladies and gentlemen it is a great privilege to me for a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries we have made it convenient to attend the faculty development program via online microsoft teams platform we are deeply grateful to respected dr gopal rao ji patil sir president of our shiv chhatrapati shikshan sanstha and is our motivator and the address of our david sokolov was a unique because of his uh, knowledge his ideas in physics as well as a style of teaching and a guidance sir i thank you for your uh, speech your guidance and your address we are just listen the powerful knowledge provoking knowledge of the sir he has spoken extensively on the conceptual ideas of the physics photonics light okay and some captions modules on optical communication thank you very much sir i take this opportunity and thanks to dr abhijit yadav sir all the colleagues and thankful to all vice principal dr raju sir vice principal sindhe sir and all the colleagues all the participants and all my faculty members of this institute thanks to members of this paper, uh, faculty development program professor dhananjay palke sir mahesh wavre sir dr renuka lunde madam swapni lundalkar sir maruti kumbar sir atul bore sir and all my staff members thank you thank you one and all thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you